So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar which is focused around returning employees to the workplace and key employer considerations. And leading this webinar we've got the lovely Yvonne Saxon who is Head of HR Diversity and Inclusion Services at Vista Employer Services and she'll be covering a number of relevant points that need to be considered when navigating this next phase. Um, we'll have the chat box open throughout the webinar so if anyone has any questions uh, please do post them in here and we'll have the opportunity to go go through a few at the very end um, and following this session today Yvonne's kindly arranged for attendees to have access to free copies of uh, remote working and hybrid working policies and have exclusive access to some hybrid working um, live management training videos too and um, also if you do find that you do need some further more specific I guess support after the, se uh, the session you'll be able to contact Yvonne directly to organise um, a separate consultation for yourself and for your business needs. Um, but for now, Yvonne, I'll hand it over to you in your very capable hands. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Abby. Uh, so with what's now time-honoured fashion, I'll share my screen and hopefully that should pop up. Is it there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm Yvonne Saxon. I work for an organisation called Vista Employer Services. Um, we provide employment law and support and HR support to large organisations as well as management training. Um, as Abby mentioned before, we've got time built in for questions at the end. And if you want to put any questions in the chat, we can then pick them up. Um, and as Abby said, there, there's, there's some links going to be sent out to you after today um, regarding some of the resources that will be available to you. So, let's get this one out of the way. Um, one of the biggest questions that I have been asked over recent weeks is whether employers can make people return to the office or whether employers can make them stay at home if they're deciding that actually they may want to close some offices um, and, and take advantage of some cost savings. Bottom line with this is, let's think about what the business need is. What does your business need? Why does your business pe need people to be coming back into the office? Or why does your business need people to be at home? And it may seem a very obvious question, but actually, if you think about it very carefully, um, sometimes the answers might surprise you. The question around whether you can actually force people to come back to the office or make them stay at home is actually a contractual one. Um, and that much depends on what you have got in your contract. So all employment contracts will, will actually say where the, where the work location is. So if your employee's contract says that they're meant to be based in city centre Manchester, then that is that their contractual place of work. If you want to change those terms and conditions, if you want to have people staying working at home, then that would be a change to those, ten, those contractual provisions. Now, if you want to change contracts, most people will probably know that you can't just do that unilaterally you would need to um, consult with people um, about those changes. And that would either be on an individual basis, but if you were talking about more than 20 people, that would have to be on a collective basis. So more than 20 people, there would be a minimum 30 day consultation period. More than 100 people, there would be a minimum 45 day consultation period. And there are some quite strict rules around what collective consultation must contain and how you elect representatives to consult with about those, those arrangements. So short answer, if it's in the contract that they work in city centre Manchester, then yes, you can say we need you to be where your work is, is located. But it's not quite as simple as that sometimes, because you may well have some objections from some people about going back to the office. And let's be sensitive to some of this, because right now there's a lot of anxieties around. Um, some people may be anxious about the commute into work if they're using public transport, that they don't want to be in close proximity to people. So maybe you can have discussions with people around that as to how you might be able to make arrangements for them to maybe start or finish 
earlier or later. That may well help them. Um, for other people, it may well be around balancing childcare. You know, they have now got used to a particular way of working and they're now looking at, well, actually, that's, that's all a bit too difficult for me now. And for other people, it may just simply be that actually they're quite scared about being surrounded by people again in close proximity. So again, it's about talking to them carefully, understanding what their concerns are and trying to find ways of dealing with that. Ultimately, if you want them to come back to the office and they don't want to come back to the office, then that becomes a much more difficult situation. And if you are going to look to enforce that, then I would be minded to tell you to take advice around that um, just because of the circumstances and every, every circumstance is, is different. The other thing to be conscious of is that if people are um, looking to work remotely or you're looking for them to work remotely, having it in mind whether it's the person that's a remote worker or whether it's their role that has now become remote because if they were to leave the organization would you be recruiting somebody to be working remote again or not and that's quite an important distinction because that deals with whether the job is located remotely or in a workplace what i would say is i wouldn't be in a rush right now to change any contracts whether that's um, to, for remote working or otherwise, because things are still changing, things are still evolving in this whole pandemic. Um, and I would very much say that we're still in an experiment. We don't know what the situation is going to be in six to 12 months time. So if you do make any changes right now, my advice would be to make them on a temporary basis. Let's suck it and see. Let's see how it goes so that as things progress, you can tweak things as you need to, rather than having to go through a whole scale change again with, with your contracts. And it's been quite interesting this week that um, Apple have hit the news um, and there's been a lot of conversations about Apple telling their employees that we want you back in the office three days a week from September. And the Apple employees are actually pushing back quite heavily on this. Um, and some of them are even marching with their feet. So it's interesting to keep an eye on that. Um, and your employees will be watching that as well quite carefully, I would imagine. So when we actually get people back into the office, I, I, I'm not keen on this word, reboarding always feels a little bit odd, but I'm going with it. Um, there's, there's a lot to think about. It's not just about let's open the doors and get people back in there. Um, so one of the things that I, I was conscious of a um, short while ago was, well, what's, what's still the same, but people might have forgotten about? People have been away from the workplace for a long time. It's, what, 15 months now? And so even simple things like, you know, what's the number on the door keypad? People might forget. So it's good to put something together with this information to remind them again of some of these things, even though it might seem obvious. Then it's worth having to think about what's different. What have you put into place in your workplace that is now going to be very different from what people have experienced before? It may well be how you've configured the office. It may well be the processes that you use um, in, in terms of how you're going to work as well. So be mindful of that and try and, um, try and you know, think about these things before they arise, before they become a difficulty for people. The other thing, obviously, these days is safety, thinking about that, that, that safety element. Um, lots of people, if they've been working from home, They've just been used to walking around their home and doing whatever they do. But when they're back in the office, you may well have requirements for them to put a mask on and wear it when they're moving around the office. Um, and that will be something that will be unusual for people to do. So it's, it, it's important that you, that you take them through that. 
And then something about habits. Um, prior to all of this happening, you know, we all used to get up in the morning. Um, we'd go and make a cup of tea. We'd go and have a shower. We'd feed the cats. We'd go and get dressed. We'd pack our bag for the day, go out the door, get on the train or get on the bus or get in the car and make our way to work. And that was our habit every single morning. If people have been working from home all this time, they're out of that habit now. And so don't be surprised that if they are coming back into the workplace, some people may find themselves being a bit late for work here and there, just because they've underestimated the time it's going to take them. So it's, that's something worth thinking about. You may want to look at a phased return, uh, bringing people back gradually. So that, you know, you've either not got too many people coming back at the same time or just enabling people to to come back at a pace when people have been off work and um, long term sick on maternity leave, for example, we often do a phased return just to kind of get them back into things again. Um, and that might be worth trying if people have been working from home. I've also mentioned retraining on here because it may well be that you're looking to do things differently or you have been doing some things differently that not everybody will be aware of. And um, so it's worth putting that on your map as well, particularly that for anyone who has been furloughed and has been totally out of the mix um, for such a long time. And then there's the subject that most people don't really want to talk about. And that's empty chairs. In many organisations, there will be people who will not be able to return to the workplace either now or any time in the future. And whilst their colleagues will probably be aware of, of, of these situations, it's very different being aware of it when you're distanced from it than when you get back into the workplace and you see the empty chairs. So it's worthwhile thinking about that and being sensitive to how teams are going to feel um, about those things. Now, we mentioned before about whether people um, can be forced back into the workplace, um, and there may well be people that um, don't want that, and we'll see that their alternative then will be to make a request for flexible working. And I should add that flexible working isn't just about the location of work. Flexible working requests can be about wanting to change times of work or wanting compressed hours. And it may well be that in your organisation, there are some people that can work from home and you'd be happy to do flexibility for them to work from home. But what about those whose jobs can't be done from home? Can you offer them flexibility around maybe their times of work, just so that you've got some kind of balance across the workforce? But inevitably, a lot of employers are going to have an increase in requests for flexible working. And a request for flexible working can be made formally by anyone who has got 26 weeks service with you. As an employer, you are duty bound to consider that request. Now, just because an employee has got a statutory right to make the request, that doesn't mean that they've got a statutory right to have that request granted. But an employer has to give the request to consideration and they can only refuse for one of eight particular reasons. And that is that either the costs will damage the business, that there's costs associated with granting that flexible working, um, that the work can't be organised amongst other staff if they're proposing changes to the time, um, that other people can't be recruited to do the work if someone's looking to go part-time or something like that, um, whether flexible working will affect quality and performance. And that'd be a really interesting one because that was the one that many employers were refusing flexible working requests on prior to COVID. But post-COVID, I think many people will say that, you know, quality and performance has been maintained 
in some, some instances it might not have been, but in many instances it will have been, and that will then mean that you actually wouldn't have a very good reason for refusing. Another reason may well be that the business can't meet customer demand with what's been proposed by the employee, or there's a lack of work to do during the proposed working times if they're proposing different times of work, or if the business is planning changes to the workforce. So what, what I would also advise is if you are looking to agree flexible working, um, then perhaps it might be best to do it on a trial basis at this moment in time. Once a flexible working request has been granted, it becomes a permanent change to terms and conditions, and the employee doesn't necessarily have a right to make another request within 12 months. So it might be wise to just kind of put things on a trial basis and see if you need to tweak things when things, when we, things are a bit clearer and we're, we're in steadier times. And it's also worth remembering that prior to COVID, the government already had on the back burner something that they were considering into changing the 26 weeks requirement of service to make the request to a day one right in that anyone, when they first join an employer, would be able to make that request. That's not happened yet, but it's still there and the government were, were planning to look at that. There's also a lot of noise has been made now about whether flexible working will become a default and actually enforcing people to work a particular way may well be the exception. So that's something to keep an eye on as well as, as we go through the coming months or maybe year, depending on how things, how things progress. If we do look to move our workforce to a remote working um, workforce or we agree to people working remotely, there's a number of considerations that we need to work, make. And at the start of the pandemic, I think we were all in the situation of, right, OK, let's make this happen. We need to we need to get people up and running, working from home. And even though we might have planned that very well, we might not have planned it as well as we would have otherwise done had we had more time available. So it's worth revisiting health and safety. Have we looked at risk assessments and DSE assessments for people working from home? As an employer, you're still obliged um, to, to look after people's health and safety, even if they are working in their own homes. Following on from there, we need to be thinking about what are the work boundaries and the well-being of employees. Um, there, there's been a lot of reports recently that employees have, have seen to work longer hours because the boundaries between home and work have now become blurred. And it's almost like presenteeism has, has gone digital. Um, and so we, we need to be conscious of that and thinking about well-being also thinking about that if it's not people's choice to work from home it may well not suit everybody some people may may suffer um, from feeling quite isolated so we need to be conscious of thinking about how are we going to manage that how are we going to make sure that we're looking after the well-being of our, of our workforce and then there's the equipment what equipment is needed to do the job safely and to do it well um, you know that I've heard of many um, people who have had employees using their own um, laptops, for example, and they've ended up having to do that just because of the pandemic and um, causing um, a, a lack, a shortage of, of equipment being available. Now that we're in steadier times, it's wise to think about whether um, you, you are going to you know, put equipment into place for people. I would always recommend that the employer should provide the equipment, um, particularly when you're thinking about uh, confidentiality, when you're thinking about data protection and the GDPR, et cetera. It's always better to have, have a work laptop or a work device. From, from those perspectives. And just on the subject of confidentiality and security, 
it's worth thinking about processes that you might want to put in place for your employees to adhere to when they're working from home. For example, if they're dealing with confidential information and they're going to have paperwork lying around at home, talking to them about how they should be holding that information and what they should be doing with it at the end of the day, putting it away safely. And be mindful of who has got access and can see their, their computer screens. Um, to, that's very much dependent upon the nature of the work that the individual is doing, of course. Another question that comes up quite often is about expenses for working from home. There is no obligation for an employer to pay for people's gas or electric or water or anything like that unless it's in the contract. Some employers are giving people allowances. Um, other employers are giving allowances um, with regard to the HMRC allowances, which says that employers can give employees who are required to work from home up to £26 per month um, tax-free, and the HMRC won't ask any questions about that. If an employer is not going to do that, an employee can make a claim for an increase in their personal allowance from HMRC. That, at this moment, is £6 per week, but note that that's £6 per week as a personal allowance, which equates to about £1.20 a week cash in the employee's pocket. And again, that's only if they're required to work from home, not if they could choose to be in the office or be at home as well. Many employers have kind of just got through the past 15 months, um, but we might need to start thinking about, well, if we've got remote working that's ongoing, how are we going to manage performance? How are we going to manage underperformance? Um, the processes may be similar as to what you would have done when you were in the workplace, um, but the ways in which you might go about it will be, will be quite different. And so you probably need to give um, some, some thought to that. Similarly, with training um, and mentoring, yes, we have formal training that takes place in the workplace, but we often forget about the informal stuff that goes on, particularly when you've got a new starter or you have a trainee who's very early in their career. And what often, what often happens with them alongside their structured trade training, um, there, there's often this what I call learning by osmosis, where people are listening and overhearing things that are taking place, they're hearing conversations, they're observing things that are going on, um, just as part and parcel of the day-to-day. And they're going to miss that. So what kind of things are you going to put in place to plug that gap? Similarly, um, although some organisations will have formal mentoring programmes, there are often informal mentoring arrangements that are taking place that people aren't even that conscious of. So what are you going to do about how people look up to other people or how people look after other people? Collaboration is a word that's been talked about an awful lot with regard to remote working. And yes, collaboration can take place over a screen, but it does have its limitations. So if you've got people who are working remotely, what kind of things are you going to do to get effective collaboration going forwards? Are you going to put some things into place where they might actually meet on a regular basis to come together and take advantage of that, what you get when you get people in a room together. And communication, when people are working remotely, how are you going to make sure that you're communicating consistently and timely and in the right way for individuals? And finally, on, on remote working, um, another question that's arisen quite often recently is about how remote remote working is. Um, a number of employees are coming um, forward to, to some of our clients and saying, well, actually, I've got a house out in Spain 
Um, and as soon as I'm going to be working remotely, I'd like to carry on working from there. And on the face of it, it may well seem like, well, if they're working remotely, does it matter where they are? Well, it might do. Because once somebody's out there in Spain working remotely and say, for example, you have said, well, we need you to come back to the UK for certain meetings or collaborative events or things like that. What happens if they can't get back? What if happens if Spain's gone into lockdown again? So you need to think about those things. But bigger than that is actually the, the employment contract and what effects they, that, that can have there. There are tax implications, and that will vary depending upon the, the, um, the, the country that the employee is based in. Um, and you'll need to take advice on that. But also, even if someone's on a UK contract and you believe, well, you know, that, that's governed by UK employment legislation, well, technically it is. But that could get overridden by any statutory employment legislation that there may be in the country that they're residing in. And that can cause all sorts of issues. So you'd be very wise to take advice on that if you are considering doing that. Moving on now to the hybrid model. So much talk has been, has been taking place about the hybrid model. And hybrid working is very much around whether you've got a hybrid team. So that may well be that you've got some people who work in the office all the time and some people that work from home all the time. Or you may have hybrid workers where those are people that are spending part of their time in the office and part of their time at home. And I like the, I like the threat, turn of phrase that um, Nationwide Building Society used the other week when they said that they were going to have all of their office based staff um, working in a hybrid way. And the way that they've expressed it is they said, well, you need to locate for your day. So be in the office or be at home, whatever's most appropriate for, for what you're actually working on that day. The other thing to think about with a hybrid model is whether that changes people's jobs in any way. Now, it may be a change in the job to work in a different way. But what about whether it may be a change of job? And what I'm thinking of here really is very much about line managers. For some of them, how to manage a hybrid team is going to draw upon skills that they may not already have. It's going to involve doing things in a very different way. So if you map out how your line managers are now having to work to manage hybrid teams, to manage hybrid workers, it may actually mean that their job is very different to what it was prior to the pandemic. And then that leads us into thinking about, well, what's, what's our management capability of dealing with that very different job? Have we trained managers sufficiently? Do we need to look at upskilling our line managers to be able to work with that kind of working model? And let's also be conscious of our line managers' well-being. Because whilst everyone's talking a lot about the employee's well-being and line managers' responsibilities in looking after employee well-being. We need to be conscious of the line manager's well-being as well. And that if they're trying to juggle a lot more than they did prior to, prior to the pandemic, then what can we do to help them um, to do that and look after their well-being? A hybrid model also brings its own challenges around inclusion. How do we make sure that everyone feels included in the same way? If some people are in the office, some people are at home, and some people are, are, are moving between the two. So we need to put a lot more focus on, on how we deal with inclusion. And also with development and promotion. Because quite often people may well, without being not a conscious decision, but often it's out of sight, out of mind sometimes, and people's presence will be judged over their performance. And so we need to make sure that people, whether they're working in a hybrid way, 
we have the same opportunities for development and the same opportunities for promotion. And when I talk about promotion, I don't just mean hierarchical um, going up the ladder promotion. I'm talking about when you've got a bunch of managers in a room and, you know, somebody starts to say, oh, well, you know, Fred did a fantastic job on this particular project last week. Mary did some fantastic work on this. This is where we're promoting people within the business um, and, you know, kind of raising awareness of what they're doing. And some of that could get missed if we're working in a hybrid way. So we need to look at how do we make sure that, that we're capturing that. Working in a hybrid model will also mean having to review all your policies because policies will have been written for the way that you're working previously. So it's worth examining all of them. Are the policies up to it? Do they work with, with a hybrid working model? And how are we going to make sure that communication works when we've got people working in very different ways? How are we going to be consistent with that? How are we going to be timely with that? And how are we going to be fair with people and make sure that people feel that there is a fairness and consistency across the piece? So that's pretty much most of what I wanted to say um, on, on, on the subject. We did have a question come in before the session today um, from somebody called Alex, who asked a question about whether they should issue new contracts now, having agreed that people can work from home. Well, I, I hope that um, the, 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 the webinar has, has dealt with that question for you, Alex, but if not, please put something in the chat box and, and Abby will, will raise that with me in, in a couple of minutes. And just the final point that I wanted to make before we go into any questions is that, as Abby mentioned earlier um, at the start of the webinar, we will be providing links for you all to receive um, a template remote working policy and a hybrid working policy, which you can, can use in your organisations. And also, we will provide two weeks of free access to line manager hybrid working videos. Um, and once you've had a look at those videos, if you'd like to look at any of the other training video suites that we have, then you know, just get in touch with me. I'm happy to arrange something like that. And finally, if you have a question that we don't get answered today and that you would like to talk to an employment lawyer about it specifically, um, then we're going to make available to you a free 15-minute conversation with one of Vista's employment lawyers. Um, and again, we'll provide you with contact details um, to me if you'd like to arrange that. So I'll just stop sharing my slides now um, whilst we get back to Abby and see what questions have come in. Thank you, Yvonne. That was really useful. I thought it was really useful and I'm sure those listening did as well. So thank you for that. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one being um, over the next few um, weeks, um, one of the delegates is doing a trial of opening their office for those that want to come in. Do they need to change their contracts for those few weeks or not? No, I, I don't believe you need to change your contracts at all. If you're doing a trial of something, I think it's worth putting something in writing just to say that you are doing a trial um, and, and putting what in there what you have agreed so that everyone knows exactly where they stand. That's, that's always worthwhile doing. But I, I wouldn't be rushing to change any contracts. We're still in the middle of a big experiment right now and things are still changing. So leave the contracts alone and just, and just put something there so that people know what they're doing. Thank you. Um, we've also had one in from Steve to say, um, do you have any suggestions on inclusion for those who are working from home? Um, because it's inevitable that they'll feel that they're missing out on the office environment. Mm. And, and this very much is this is one of those um, pressures that's going to be on line managers, because it, it does put a lot more pressure on, on the line managers. Because um, if you were all in the office, of course, you know, they would be talking to people together and at the same time and those kinds of things. So I think it's about making sure that line managers get some support in all of this and some training in how best to 
um, almost you know, structure their communications and make sure that they have they ticked everybody off. You know, have they made sure that they've contacted everyone? Because you can feel like you have, but when your day's been busy and you've got to the end of the day and you think you've spoken to everybody and you haven't done, or if you speak to some people earlier in the week and it's something really, really important and somebody else doesn't get spoken to till two weeks later, they can be left feeling, you know, very left out of that. Um, so it's, it's having that consciousness of, of making sure that you, you have included everyone and putting into place some processes. There may be some, um, there may be some processes that you use, some communications that you leave with line managers to do. There may be other communications that lend themselves more readily to um, online communication. Um, you know, you may use Microsoft Teams, for example, for, for certain things, but there are other things that that probably wouldn't be suitable for. So I think it's worth drawing up um, some kind of a, a model for yourselves as an organisation that's going to suit you as an organisation, because everyone's very different in, in how they like to receive information and you will know your people best. Thank you. So um, we've had a further question to say, um, is there any guidance on how to configure your office to meet social distancing requirements, um, i.e. what's a reasonable distance and do the desks need to face a certain way? I don't know if you... Well, the, the government have provided guidance on this. Um, so if you go to the government website, there will be, there is guidance for officers um, that explains what, what the guidance is. Um, and as these things are a moving feast as well. So, you know, currently it is about trying to trying to keep space between people. I know that lots of officers, they have tried to configure desks so that people aren't facing each other so that they're more side by side, if you like, or behind each other. Um, so those kinds of configurations work well. Um, but there is a lot of guidance on the government website. There is also guidance on the HSE website as well. Um, so it's worth having a look at that. Um, but it is something that I think everyone's very conscious of. And we don't yet know. I mean, the 21st of June was 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 kind of trumpeted as, you know, the doors are open and everything's just going to go back to normal. Well, that's looking more and more unlikely as this week goes on. Um, but, you know, if we do kind of open up the doors again, what we don't know is whether the government are still going to say, well, the guidelines are going to be you'll need to provide still have certain amount of distancing which may actually change um, your plans on how many people you can bring back into the workplace if you can't configure um, the workplace to, to accommodate those people. Thank you. Um, so also sorry um, Anna's worried that some of her team members may be feeling overworked at home. Do you have any suggestions on how to manage that? And, and this is coming through an awful lot. And, and I think it's important to try and understand why are people overworking? Um, because one element could be, I don't know whether any, anyone remembers, um, a few a couple of months back, Boris Johnson was talking about, let's get everyone back to the offices. Come on, you know, you've all had enough days off now. And just in that very sentence, you know, that kind of gave the message that there's a lot of people think, oh, you know, if you're working from home, it's a bit of a sky. And, and that's kind of got under people's skin. And so people feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm probably being seen to be skiving a bit, so I better do some extra to make sure that people don't think that that's the case. So you could have that going on. So if you've got that, it's really, really important to send that message to people that we do not expect you to do this. The, the other thing is, is about line managers having good quality conversations with individuals um, and trying to explore with them, you know, what to, I, you know, I noticed that you were working quite late the other night. I saw an email from you at X time and exploring my, why that might be, because for some people it might well be that they down tools, gave the kids the tea and what have you, and then just went back to doing some work later on because that suited them. Um, but in other cases, if it's just that people just can't seem to break themselves off from work, then I think the line manager needs to have, um, have some conversations with them about that. 
Um, and I've just seen something pop up that someone said um, that, that people just, some people just don't seem to be able to break off from work because they don't seem to have anything else in their life, I think is what I was reading there <laughs> from, from that. And, and, and that's quite possible because in these times, you know, people haven't been able to go and socialise. They've not been able to do hobbies. There are a lot of people who live alone or, or don't have um, support networks outside of work. Um, and they rely quite heavily on the workplace for their, for their social lives. And so if they haven't got that, sometimes they may well just be inclined to go, well, you know, I'll just carry on working because I've got nothing else more exciting to do. And again, I think that's that's a really sensitive conversation for a line manager to have with individuals. And it may well be as a workplace um, that you could share resources about these kinds of things. There's lots of stuff out there on the Internet of, you know, well-being for employees to take care of themselves and things that they should be conscious of around overworking and stuff like that. There's tons of stuff out there. It's brilliant stuff. And if you could share that maybe, you know, on your intranet, on, on Microsoft Teams, things like that, you know, that, that's another helpful thing that, that might help for, for, for individuals. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to read this one out. This is from Alex. I'll read it out um, verbatim. So I believe I can agree a trial of regular home working in writing prior to needing to change contracts. Once the trial has been concluded, if it is successful, do I need to update the contracts or is it sufficient to keep a written agreement of home working and the details related to this on their file? So I would say that a trial period at this moment in time, I would look for a fairly lengthy one because everything's just changing all the time. Um, but ultimately, if your aim is that someone is going to be a home worker forever, then you are going to be end up changing the contract because even if you've just got a written agreement, eventually if that person has been sat working at home for two years as a result of something that you've agreed, not just because the pandemic's meant that they've had to for a bit, um, then it's almost become an implied contract because it's happened for so long um, and that's what you agreed to do. So I would always say that once you get to a point that this has worked, this is how it's going to be going forwards, I would always say get it bolted down contractually properly because then no one's in any doubt as to what's happening. Great, thank you. And I think this is the final um, question. Do you have any advice on how to manage underperformance remotely? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really interesting one because it depends on what the underperformance is so and again I, I, I know I, I have a bit of a crap record here um, but this comes down to line managers managing people and having conversations with them regularly and understanding people so if the underperformance is that the person if, if as a line manager you set objectives for your team and people are an individual isn't achieving what should be achieved then you need to explore why is that not being achieved and that's very that's pretty much the same kind of thing that you do if you have them in the office the difficulty you've got is that when they're working remotely you can't observe them you can't see what they're doing you can't suggest that they shadow someone if they're not you know kind of getting to grips with something it becomes a little bit more difficult but it's about having those conversations to understand why are they not achieving it and it all depends on the reasons as to why they're not achieving it. So if they're not achieving it because they don't know what they're doing, then is that a training need? If they're not achieving it because they are very stressed out about something, so it may well be that they've got personal issues going on at home, and it may well be that you might need to have a look at, well, is there something that you can do to give them some extra support for a period of time? So it's all the same kind of things that you would do if you have them in the workplace. It's just that because you've got that distance between you, you probably need to have those more regular check-ins um, and, and those more regular catch-ups with them um, just to be keeping on top of it. 
That's really useful. And we have had one further question in that I think it's quite good. Um, is do you feel a company needs to consider if their workforce is fully vaccinated prior to asking them to return to the office? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, and I think everyone probably would have seen the headlines this morning from um, the Charlie What's His Face at Pimlico Plumbers, who's now come, you know, he's put his first job advert out and said, you can't apply for a job here unless you're vaccinated. <laughs> so, you know, this, this has got, you know, this is going to run and run and run. Um, and, I, and I don't, you know, nobody's saying that nobody can go, can't go anywhere unless they're fully vaccinated. And if an employer was to say, you're not coming back into the workplace until you're fully vaccinated, I think that that throws up all sorts of issues. First of all, how are you going to ask people whether they've been vaccinated or not? Because the very fact that you ask them, if you are then going to record that, that throws up a whole raft of GDPR issues. Why are you asking for that information? And you have to justify that in quite a strong way. What are you going to do with that information? How are you going to handle that information? And right now, even the government aren't saying that the NHS workers, for example, have to be vaccinated. I know there was a leaked email a couple of weeks back about this as to they were thinking about these things, but no one's come out and said, we are going to make sure that people are vaccinated. So it's very much one of those things that you as an employer you may decide that you don't want to open up the office at all until we've got to I don't know is it July August when all age groups will have been invited just to to, to kind of give a bigger shot at the fact that more people might have been vaccinated but some members of your workforce can't be vaccinated because they may have medical reasons that they're not able to have the vaccination for. There are many ladies who are contemplating um, becoming pregnant who right now are making the decision not to take the vaccination because there hasn't been enough um, research in that. So, so there's all sorts of reasons why people might not have been vaccinated. So I think you have to be very, very, very careful with that one. Wow, is what a minefield. <laughs> You've done really well, Yvonne. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. I will, I will actually just add to that because I know what the next question will be, <laughs> is that if you have somebody at work who says, I do not want to come back to work until I know that everyone in my team has been vaccinated, Again, that I, I can see that's going to throw up all over the place as well for, for a lot of people. And again, that's going to be about having a very sensitive conversation with them to say, well, why is it that you feel that, you know, what is it that's worrying you? And it may well be that they've got some really, really genuine concerns and some real strong anxieties, medical reasons, etc. But for wanting that, and you may need to think about some of the reasons why they're, they're saying that. So it is one that will come up. I know it will come up. Um, there will be instances, I think, where it might come up just out of sheer, I'm going to dig my heels in. Um, but there will be a lot of instances that there are genuine reasons why people are worried. Right. So I think that comes to the end of the questions. Thank you so much for those that have sent the questions in. Um, as we said at the beginning, for those that have um, logged on to the chat, we'll make the slides available on our membership area and we will email those out to you and you'll be able to get the links to all the policies and the training videos that Yvonne has mentioned in a presentation. Yvonne's contact details will also be on there. If, you, if there is a question that you have, you can have your consultation with Yvonne um, if you'd like to do so. So I think it just remains to say thanks so much, Yvonne. You've been really, really helpful and I'm, and I'm really pleased pleased that you've been as clear as you have and uh, thanks to all for listening thanks very much everybody thank yeah. you thank you bye 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 bye, bye.